Here to discuss whether or not immunotherapy can scale up, please welcome Dr. David Chang, co-founder, president, and CEO of Allogen Therapeutics, Dr. Sarah Naim, partner at New Enterprise Associates, and Dr. Alex Marson, associate professor at UCSF and scientific director of biomedicine at the Innovative Genomics Institute. Here to lead the conversation is The Atlantic's deputy editor, Ross Anderson. All right, uh, David, I want to start with you. We're going to talk a little bit more about CAR T therapy in a bit, but first let's stay uh, on the wider set of uh, uh, treatments that we know as immunotherapy. It's been sort of hard to uh, pay any attention to biomedical news without encountering these therapies in recent years. However, uh, there still are cancers and patients for whom they don't work, and I was wondering if you could tell us why that is. Yeah, so I think, you know, before going to that particular, you know, answering that question, I think we have to look at the innovation as a stepwise process. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in this field long enough to know that, you know, 10, 12 years ago, most pharmaceutical industry executive would say immuno-oncology, that doesn't work, we are going to stay out of it. And it wasn't until 2011 when BMS got ipilimumab approved and with, uh, you know, new data coming from the... Uh, PD-1 inhibitors, the excitement really began. So where we are now, uh, even in a setting where a patient has a metastatic widespread disease, immunotherapy can provide uh, treatment benefit that is nearing cure. Uh, in melanoma cases, as Lori Glimshire earlier talked about, about 20% of the patients really benefit long term. And in other solid tumors, we are also finding that the benefit continues. So that's where we are, and then as the video shows, I mean, this science is continuing to, uh, innovation is continuing. The cell therapy, this is a new, you know, treatment that's coming up that's increasing the treatment benefit to another level. So I was involved in the development of CD19 chimeric antigen receptor therapy, yes, Cara, and there's also another product, Kimraya, that's approved in this setting. Here in the leukemic patients or patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you're talking about somewhere between one-third and one-half of the patients. After a single infusion of cell therapy remaining disease-free up to uh, two-plus years, which is the latest uh, follow-up that the companies have presented. Uh, Alex, can you tell us what sort of uh, cancers and tumor types in particular are difficult for immunotherapy? Sure. I, I think it's important to think really about these two types of immunotherapy that David talked about, the checkpoint blockades mm -hmm. where you're taking the patient's own immune system and releasing the breaks, and then the cell therapies. And so I, I think for the real poster child of success for the checkpoint blockade has been melanoma. Mm. I think that's where we really saw that clearly the immune system is able to recognize melanoma, but there's breaks on it that prevent it from being effective at clearing melanoma, and checkpoint has been a revolution there. Mm. I think that we're now starting to see that march out for checkpoint blockades to certain types of lung cancer and other sort of other specific types of cancer. But most cancers still don't respond, and so we need to figure out what's happening there. Is it that there are no, no immune cells that are recognizing the tumor, or is it that we still haven't found the right breaks that we need to release for those patient, patients? On the other side, the cell therapy is the early poster child of incredible success, led in large part by David, was the CD19, the going after, and that's taking immune cells and making them recognize something that they might not naturally recognize, mm -hmm. recognize leukemic or lymphoma cells. And that's been an incredible success. But for cell therapies, we still have yet to see real success in expanding into solid organ tumors, where there's still an incredible need. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, I want to go to you. You have sort of a unique uh, investor's bird's eye view uh, of the landscape of cell therapies, which is just this kind of, uh, frankly, revolutionary set of new treatments. Can you give us a sense, not just David's, not just the CAR-T, but how many of these new therapies are out there and what sort of successes you're seeing with them? Yeah, so uh, it's really an amazing, exciting time because not only do we have approved CAR-T therapies, but we have this whole stable of additional approaches that are behind it. Uh, so pretty much every week I see a, a new company that's trying to go after some of the challenges uh, with CAR-T therapy or TCR therapy, which is another way of reprogramming T cells or some of these other um, approaches 
uh, trying to go after the challenges in different ways. So one approach is to look at other types of immune cells. So the T cells that were shown in the video um, are the place that we started, but people also have looked at macrophages, which are a larger cell type that uh, go around and engulf or phagocytose uh, bacteria, viruses, and even cancer cells. So could we engineer those to recognize specific antigens that would uh, allow them to go out and attack a tumor? Or natural killer cells, which as their name implies, are by a by design, um, go out and hunt for bacteria, viruses, or cells that don't belong. Uh, and uh, the, another way, another approach would be to try to make T cells more like some of these other cell types, perhaps making them more phagocytic, as we say. Um, maybe one challenge of that is that they're smaller than a macrophage, so how, how much they can engulf. So we, there's all these different challenges, and some of these cell types may not persist as long as T cells persist, so you may have to deliver them um, over and over again uh, in more of a chronic therapy. And that has its trade-offs, but could also be, you know, an okay trade-off, an acceptable trade-off for certain uh, cell types. Then there are also all of these different approaches that, that are trying to mimic what cell therapy does without having to infuse cells. So things like T-cell engagers, uh, which can be infused. They're not cells, but they allow the T-cell to be tethered to a cancer cell and then induce this whole immune response. And there's been some really impressive clinical responses with those. Uh, then, but there are also challenges to scaling up and, again, getting to more and more different cancers. Uh, and uh, other approaches that, that, that we found, seen that are interesting, uh, trying to modify certain cells that would be, um, like B cells are killed by CAR T therapy, and then since B cells make antibodies, you can address this by giving the patient antibodies uh, when they're on a CAR T therapy. So some people are out trying to make engineer B cells so they can be given back to the patient and they'll be resistant to the CAR T therapy or making certain modifications in the T cells. There are many approaches at academic centers mm -hmm. where they're looking at many, many different things to make the T cells more persistent uh, to try to reduce things, reduce things like cytokine release syndrome, which I think we'll talk about a little bit more, a really bad side effect. So we've seen this whole plethora of approaches and also adaptability because anytime you're going after a specific antigen that can be expressed by a cancer, there's a possibility that some of the cancer cells don't express that protein, are not going to be attacked by the cancer, by the, by the T cell, um, and so you could have resistance. And there are many patients who do, in fact, develop resistance and, and don't have a long-term response. Uh, so one of the companies that we backed, a company called Arcelix, is uh, trying to make an adaptable approach, which you can modify and have the cells circulating, but come in and with, with something and basically allow them to then recognize a different antigen if the cancer cell starts presenting a different antigen. So it's an amazing time with a lot of different approaches. And when you, you mentioned data, I think the hard part is they're not always great models for looking at these approaches. They're limited models. And when you think about mouse models, um, for many of the therapies that have been developed over the years, you could use um, xenograft models, which are taking human tumors and putting them in a mouse and seeing if the, you know, the, the tumor can be eradicated by your therapy. When you start thinking about the immune system and how to model that in a mouse, it's, very, it's much more challenging because an immune system in a mouse is different than in a human, and many of these mice don't have uh, any immune system or, or limited immune system. So uh, we see all these different companies come through, and they have data in, in different models. A lot of their challenges sometimes are just to find a model that replicates the particular mechanism they're going after. So you know, TLR, TLR8 therapy, it's one, one approach in, I won't get into the specifics, but it's, it's a TLR7 in mice. So it's a, it's, you can model it in mice, but it's not going to be the exact same system. And you may actually have to make a mouse version of your therapy to administer mice to say, do we think this is going to work? So those are some of the challenges in just looking at the early stages of uh, these really exciting therapies is, you know, how, how broadly applicable will they be? Can we really get a sense of how efficacious they'll be looking at uh, animal systems? And when are they ready to take to prime time and actually try in humans? Hmm. And how is, I mean, outside just your firm, how is the funding environment for these, uh, for these treatments? Like if anyone has a, a good idea, is, it, is there a lot of investor excitement around this? There, there's tremendous investor excitement. I think we're really at a crossroads when it comes to immunotherapy and, and cell therapy. I mean, I think there's a, been a little fatigue on uh, the checkpoint inhibitor space because mm -hmm. we've come to understand that early success in you know, single-arm trials where you're just looking at patients with a particular drug 
or sometimes a, dr a drug combined with a, a, an innovative drug combined with an approved drug and not and comparing to historical data, that may not prove out when you go to larger randomized trials against um, the approved drug and placebo. Uh, so we, there was a big failure in the space. Uh, the IDO, sp it, IDO is a target that everyone was really excited about to combine with PD-1, checkpoint inhib inhibition. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, didn't play out in the bigger trial. So there's a there's a little fatigue on the checkpoint space. Um, a, a little bit of you know, folks saying we don't really know which combo is going to work. It's going there are so many trials going on right now, and actually I think that has put uh, more attention on cell therapy mm -hmm. because there are still so many uh, you know so many tumor types that we can address with cell therapy. And as David mentioned, the with checkpoint inhibition, we're still we have good response rates, but there's still not <coughs> rivaling the levels of some of the cell therapies in hematologic cancers or blood-based cancers. Mm. So we could um, harness the activity that we see in blood-based cancers with uh, cell therapy that could be, you know, you know, some, you know say 50% or a third of patients may have a long-lived long response, but up to 70 or 80% may have an initial response, and yet you know, some of those trials are still playing out. That would be revolutionary. So I do think, actually, we see really big funding rounds being mm. uh, being done for these companies because it takes a lot of capital to uh, develop all the manufacturing systems and to do all the uh, different, you know, animal studies and to, to try to hone in on a product to eventually get to people much, much more expensive than um, certainly small molecule, you know, traditional drugs or even large molecules like antibodies mm. and, and that type of thing. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, David, we all saw the CAR-T video mm -hmm. and, you know, it was neatly compressed into this sort of like two-minute animation, but give us a, a better sense of what that process actually entails. So, you know, CAR-T therapy, when you think about it, you know, this is really a different form of drug or therapy, you know, whichever word that you want to use. The drugs that we are used to are small molecule uh, and then, you know, biologics like antibodies. But, you know, CAR-T is a living therapy that's made out of the cell. So what is required to manufacture the CAR-T cells are both a component of gene engineering, manipulating the, you know, the composition of the genes in the cells to allow the cells to do something that you want them to do seek out the cancer and destroy them. And the second one is handling of the cells, whether you're using T cells or other types of cells, engineering them, making them so that they can recognize and they also proliferate in numbers. As a living therapy, you know, one of the reasons that you're getting such a deep and lasting response is that when they encounter the target cancer cells, they explode in numbers. So 10 cells become hundreds and thousands of cells, and from that comes more effective uh, 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 killing. So where the field is right now is an autologous space, which means you take the cells out from the patient, you go through the complex uh, manufacturing process, which at the end can only serve one patient, the patients where the cells came from. Now, you know, we're trying to do something that's more innovative, where you're taking cells from another person, healthy donor, and there are many reasons why one may want to do that. And then you use the uh, gene engineering and gene editing. And I would say that you know, without the gene editing, this whole approach would not have been feasible. And gene editing is a new technology that came about probably about six, seven years ago. And so here, the manufacturing process, instead of serving one patient, now can at the current time, probably about 100 patients, and when we sort of project out the future, a manufacturing process that can uh, treat you know, thousands of patients. And there are many benefits of uh, having the, uh, the, you know, the on-time treatment. Patient who makes the decision to undergo the treatment can get the treatment right away instead of having to wait. And then also having the inventory where you don't have to worry about the manufacturing at each time. So, you know, in many ways, uh, when I think about the CAR-T therapy, the movie that comes to my mind all the time is a Fantastic Voyage. I don't know whether <laughs> you've seen it. Uh, miniaturizing something and then having the submarine do all the things that you want it to do. And this is really, you know, the you know, building block of how the cell therapy is done and going from, you know, you know manufacturing, you know, sort of custom-made CAR, you know, for one versus having an assembly line where you can manufacture the cells for many patients. And that's where the field is going. 
And Alex, you're actually involved in the, uh, the engineering of these T-cells uh, with CRISPR. Can you tell us a little bit um, about uh, your work there and also just the, the challenges right now? Yeah. So I think it's important to explain a little bit that the first generation of CAR T-cells were made with an, kind of a crude genetic engineering tool. They're used with viruses. And that always sounds a little strange. Vi viruses are really good, though, at inserting their genetic material into human cells but they do it in a way that's kind of sloppy. They will put the extra genetic material somewhere into the genome of every cell that they infect. That's worked really well in the initial CAR T cell therapies, but it's, it's not very precise. It's really expensive, to, and it takes a long time every time you want to design a new virus. So what we're seeing now is really an incredible convergence of two technologies. One is cell therapies. Where you're, we're taking cells out of patients' bodies, growing them up, and putting them back in. The other is advances in the ability to manipulate the genome of these cells. So CRISPR, I think, often gets talked about in the popular press as a way of making designer babies. And that is not where I would like to see CRISPR being used mm. in the context of medicine. What it really is fundamentally is an ability to change genetic sequence. And DNA is the source code that tells cells how to behave which means that if we can go in and start making edits to that genetic material, we can start programming cells to behave how we want. And this is exactly what Dave is, David is talking about, that we can start actually engineering cells that are effective at getting to the right site in the body, that have logic built into them so that if they find a tumor, they know how to respond in a way that's productive to clear the tumor without causing side effects. And so what CRISPR is, is really the ability to go in and do just that, to pick any site in the code, in the DNA of each of the cells that we're taking out of the body, and make precise, ed precise edits. We can now take pieces of DNA out. We can change individual letters, the individual nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. And now we can actually start inserting, cutting, and pasting new genetic sequences in. And this is allowing us to take the program of the cells, the DNA, and reprogram it to make those cells behave how we want and enhance their ability to clear tumors. Hmm. I want to go to a Slido question or two in a minute, but could you also just tell us quickly how uh, these re-engineered T cells aren't yeah. just for cancer? What other sorts of diseases might they be able to treat? So we know that the immune system is involved in almost any disease that you can think about. Hmm. So we've had an incredible lesson in how important the immune system is for cancer. We know it's also important in regulating itself for patients with autoimmune diseases, like multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. And there's certain cells that are critical for preventing the development of those diseases. So we're also thinking about genetically modifying those cells, which are called regulatory T cells, to develop new treatments for autoimmune diseases. We're thinking about ways to make the immune cells better at finding infections clearing infections that come up in transplant patients hmm. or come up in patients with congenital immunodeficiencies. And then the new, where there's sort of a broader horizon is thinking, once we're genetically modifying cells and changing their behavior, we can start adding new functions into immune cells. And I, I don't know exactly where this is going to go, but maybe we'll, we're seeing early evidence that maybe immune cells could be used to treat heart failure, or maybe we can think about making them better at treating neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So that's a little bit more science fiction, mm. but I think that fundamentally cells are going to be the delivery vehicle for, as a new type of medicine. And now we're just starting to really imagine what they might be capable of with the proper genetic engineering. Mm. That's exciting. Um, I want to start, I have a question from Josh Mark who asks, what kind of role will neoantigens play in the future of immunotherapy? So let me take that. Uh, neoantigens, uh, so just to def you know, clarify the question, so these are the mutation in cancer cells that will make the cancer cells different from the normal cells. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges in treating cancer is that they are so similar to the normal cells. So if there is a way to differentiate the cancer cells, I mean, that really gives a you know, great way to specifically, you know, go after the cancer cells while leaving all the normal tissues alone. And neoantigens really provide that avenue. And so here, you know, people are working, trying to utilize a neoantigen as a ways to boost immune system vaccine approaches. Uh, there are companies that are, you know, trying to generate the CAR T cells or T cells that are specific for neoantigen 
uh, expressed on the cancer cells. I think this is another way where we can really increase the repertoire of different tumors that we can go after. Hmm. Um, thinking about, and th another question, thinking about preventative care, are there opportunities to use CAR-T before a patient is diagnosed with cancer to start treatment at the moment of detection? It's hard to think how that I don't, would work. But. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the challenge is um, it, these are really, these are experiment, well, there's some approved therapies and there are also many, you know, experimental therapies, but they have side effects and they're very costly. And unfortunately right now, even all the patients who could receive these therapies or be indicated for these therapies, you can't receive them for a variety of issues, whether, you know, that's cost, um, access, they're mainly going to be available at large academic yeah. centers, um, the, uh, centers of excellence. Uh, and then also they may be too sick to receive the therapies. But when you're talking about, of course, you're talking about trying to go after patients before they even have cancer. You know, some, sometime in the future, maybe, um, you know, way in the future, we'll have mm -hmm. the ability and it'll be cost effective to kind of constantly surveil what's happening with uh, patients' systems and, you know, go in and get a test and see if there are any antigens that are known to be um, what we call, uh, you know, activating <laughs> mutations or cancer-driving mutations. And if, you know, you find a tiny bit of that, then, you know, the patient gets rushed to, to have some um, vaccine based on that. But I think that's really science fiction right now. We, we're not still able to, you know, make these therapies as widely available as they, you know, optimally would be. Of course, you know, David and yeah. others are working on that. I'm a little bit more optimistic in this mm. setting. Mm -hmm. Like anything else, cost of the CAR T therapy will come down in time, mm. without a question. And the second, you know, some of the side effects that we are talking about here, cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity is a well-publicized adverse events. Mm -hmm. I think there is an element of precision medicine or predictive medicine that will play in a role. So you can distinguish patients who will tolerate the treatment well to, from the patients who will not uh, have a more intense uh, attention that will be required. You have to realize that people who undergo CAR T therapy, more than half of them, they're just in the hospital waiting to be discharged. Mm. And then it's the other you know, 10 to 20 percent who will get in, in, require more intensive care that needs attention. So this is really where the precision and predictive medicine has to come in play. And the third thing is, we all know that the best way to really take care of the cancer is early on, post-surgery, not exactly the setting the question was posed about. There's a whole area of neoadjuvant treatment where you eliminate all the you know, remaining cancer cells after surgical resection. And I think that's where the CAR-T therapy can really come in play early on so that after the treatment, one-time treatment, the patient doesn't need any more treatment for that cancer. Mm. David, Sarah, Alex, it's been great. Thanks for being with us this morning. <clears throat>